Alright, let's see where this goes. Hi, Rick here with my review of Episode 1 of Season 3 of Discovery, The Hope That Is You Part 1. So let me just preface this by saying I didn't think much of Discovery Season 1, it was trying too hard in places and mashed together too many elements from Trek like an excited child with a new box of toys. Season 2, however, did a lot more to win me over, not just by utilising and adding to the canon, but generally dropping war as the central theme and brightening the tone. So let's see if Season 3 can continue this upward trend. There will be spoilers ahead, because there's so much I need to talk about, as for better or worse, Discovery has embraced its tenure of shaking up the status quo. We instantly see a much more expressive Michael Burnham, even more so than in Season 2 of Discovery. Partly this is because she survived a fall from orbit, and then was drugged, but still, it was fun if a little surreal to see such extremes coming from a character that is normally either taciturn or weepy. Her elation at realising there is still life in the galaxy is a confirmation that the sacrifice of Discovery was not in vain. Throughout the episode, she is acting as the audience proxy in that she is completely out of her element and will be discovering how this galaxy is alongside us. She has neither context nor control of anything around her anymore, and this is reflected by her near panic attack after surviving her crash. She has to focus down on her Starfleet training and orate everything she is doing, something to keep her focus, something she still has control over. And throughout the episode we see her struggling to regain some semblance of it, from her insisting on being the one to count down to her persistence to get the final word. The time she's emerged into is very unlike traditional depictions of Star Trek, not surprising that it takes place almost entirely away from the familiar, which in turn places long-time viewers of Trek in the dark as much as the Discovery crew will be when they arrive. We are also introduced to Book, also fresh off a high action piece, who at first seems like a standoffish rogue, because he is, but not without reason. It seems he's made a lot of enemies, so prefers to avoid discussion and keep moving. Of course, as the episode goes on, we see that he in fact does have a softer core, but it's not revealed until after he's already betrayed Burnham. We also get to see some strange power that Book wields. He has a way with nature, both flora and fauna, making him a space druid. It looks like there was some form of tech at work when he used his powers, but there could be some alien DNA mixed in there somewhere, I'm sure we'll find out. However, I do not like the design of his vessel. Again, it's very different from what we've seen before, but that's not enough to make me appreciate it. Although internally, I do love the set, it reminds me of a studio apartment. So, I'm pretty happy they acknowledged the Temporal Cold War, with a line that Book throws out saying that time travel technology has been destroyed ever since the close of the war. Well, so long as time travel is on the table, the Cold War would persist, and considering its very nature, it created a whole nexus of conflict spanning centuries. Of course, the only way it would come to a close is with the agreement to disarm. This would go on to explain why the 32nd century, as depicted in Discovery, was not altered by entities like Daniel's Temporal Agency, as it was the outcome they wanted, in part, an end to Time Wars. Admittedly, it must have been hard to stick to a Temporal Prime Directive in this instance. So that's one worry and unresolved plot point from Enterprise that was neatly tied up. I was also wondering just how they'd portray such advanced levels of technology that should exist in 3188, especially as Discovery updated the gear of their show even in the TOS era. But the fact that almost every piece of equipment, from furniture to weapons, seems to be fabricated on the spot shows a crazy level of sophistication. There were several other nice lore touches too, like the commonplace use of quantum slipstream drive, which I would still like to see, and I wonder what their maximum warp factor is now. There were also the use of miniaturised personal transporters that could beam at multiple people, similar in the prototype seen in Star Trek Nemesis. I'm also given the distinct impression that the entire of the Milky Way galaxy is accessible, in part, to current powers, or at least it was before the burn, suggested by the spanning maps from the relay station. So, we also get an answer to just what the burn was. It was a time, approximately between 3068 to 88, when dilithium crystals, even those in the various warp reactors of starships, detonated. No one knows why, but such a catastrophe led to Starfleet and the Federation being pretty much cut off. 
I was hoping for a, an Omega Molecule detonation, and personally I'm a little disappointed that this was not the case, but I'm willing to see where this dilithium explosion goes. Of course, now the big question, the first Burnham thinks to ask, is still unanswered a hundred or so years later, what caused it? I'll speculate at the end of this video. Despite the burn, the factions and organisations that crept up in the interim need to use dilithium, as what other options are there? Well, plenty, but Book mentions that the Gorn also played around with creating artificial wormholes, but their experiments destroyed subspace in a localised area, so it sounds like the galaxy may need a spore drive, providing the mycelial network also hasn't been consumed by some catastrophe. It's an interesting development to find the Andorians working alongside the Orions, having formed their own compact business arrangement, at least as far as trade goes, from the hub city of Mercentile and Requiem on the planet Hema. A good indicator of how fractured the galaxy has become is one of the UFP's founding species going at it alone and made its own arrangements. It looks like this courier organisation is very open as to who it recruits though, as there are many other species from Cardassian to Lurian, which reminds me a nice easter egg. Morn was a courier in occupation, so we still have a Lurian courier in 3188. So now the rampant speculation I promised, what could make Dilithium explode, not only explode but simultaneously across every ship in existence? Well, dilithium has been used by numerous factions for thousands of years as part of the reaction chamber in warp travel. There have seldom been incidents where the crystalline mineral exploded, it's incredibly stable, especially when refined. I mean, it kind of has to be under the intense energies of an antimatter reaction. The fact that it all went up at once clearly suggests that there was some triggering event, perhaps a signal, a sudden shift in the fabric of subspace, or a broadcast event from some other power or entity. There are records of a sort of resonance effect that can build in the lattice structure of the crystals, that left unchecked can cause it to shake itself apart, so it can be done. It's just very difficult and seldom natural. So let's just hope that they don't reveal that dilithium crystals are actually sentient and that they unionised and started exploding out of protest. The point is, dilithium doesn't spontaneously explode, and this seems further supported by the fact that it sees continual use since the burn. I feel that uncovering this mystery will be one of the two central plot threads moving forwards, the other being the reunification of the Federation's disparate installations. This was hammered home to a point in the first episode, that the United Federation of Planets is more than technology and its infrastructure, it was founded on the ideals of cooperation, exploration and understanding, and so long as these endure, so does the UFP. At least that's the notion that of those true believers who remain following those values. A large portion of the galaxy seems to have moved on with their own lives, while what's left of Starfleet tries to retain some hold on its past. So what we have, according to Sahil, the unofficial liaison of Starfleet and the Courier Waypoint, is a series of sporadic former UFP outposts with no idea how each isolated location is doing. Then again, he is limited to only 30 sectors in range, which again, what a leap in technology. Oh, I can only scan 30 sectors, long range is still offline. Back in TNG, 30 sectors is long range, a sector is multiple star systems. Still, space is big, and if the Federation became a galaxy spanning power, as I suspect, then yeah, 30 sectors is really a tiny area in comparison. There are even a few ally ships still out there, although very few, and I think a drive that doesn't rely on warp travel may well be very useful in the efforts to reconnect the UFP. By the time the episode came to an end, I'm on board with the themes of this show, that the UFP needs to be reunified after a disaster, which is more than could be said of season 1 for me. Yeah, I liked it, despite the absence of the rest of the Discovery crew, I'm curious to see their reactions to the current state of the galaxy, but all in all, it's a very different climate that Discovery finds itself in. We share in the fish out of water aspect that Burnham finds herself in because this universe has familiar elements but in unfamiliar places, so there can be no assumptions. The 32nd century is radically different from old Star Trek, but I mean, come on, 930 years is a long time, and no nation lasts forever without change. 
the biggest issue that this show has, one that is beginning to make itself apparent even in episode 1, is that if you change too much you risk making something more akin to a different sci-fi than Trek. Thanks for watching this review on Discovery's Season 3 premiere. What do you think of it? Personally, I'm not at all upset at the Federation's diminished state, and I wonder how far the UFP's reach will extend once it's restored. That question will keep my attention for sure. So, thanks for watching, I've been Rick and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.